Hi there, I'm going to talk to you today about the provisional government, this really kind of busy and complex time in Russia um, throughout 1917. Um, the Tsar abdicated in the train carriage outside Pskov. Remember, the Bolshevik workers on the railways had prevented the train from getting into Petrograd, where it was supposed to be coming back to um, solve the food riots, the bread crisis that was going on and the mutinies at the Petrograd garrison. Um, for paper three, for the DP history, you certainly need to be able to distinguish very clearly between the two revolutions um, and really make sure that you're solid on when everything happened and it really is worth making a timeline for 1917 and getting really everything clear in your head when it happened and if you kind of muddle up when the Tsar abdicated, which was March 1917, and when the Bolsheviks come to power in November 1917, you can get yourself in a real mess. So the Tsar abdicates in favour of his brother, who sensibly refuses the throne, and it passes, um, responsibility passes to the Duma. Um, remember, the Duma by this stage, after Stolypin's electoral reforms in the... Um, and sort of after the second Duma in 1906, 1907, has become a little bit more conservative, but it's still dominated really by the, the kind of traditional liberalish parties, the cadets and Octoberists in particular. Um, and it's a body of the Duma that form the provisional government, the temporary government. And they simply have one responsibility to manage Russia, organise Russia, and to get um, a series of elections set up for a constituent assembly, which would then turn... Um, in turn, write Russia's new constitution for this post-Tsarist age. Um, the Petrograd Soviet is also in extant at this time. Remember, that had come into being in 1905, that committee of workers and soldiers. And it's Kerensky, Alexander Kerensky, the only individual who is a member of both of the organisations. And he proves um, the kind of conduit and the link between the two organisations. They're meeting in the same palace in Petrograd. Um, Orlando Figes writes very well about kind of Kerensky's role and his personality. So if you're interested, have a look on his website and you can get some good background into the type of person that Kerensky was and the role that he played. But he's the bridge between these two organisations. And the Petrograd Soviet moves very quickly to take control. If you've got a copy of the Corin and Fine textbook, um, it goes into a lot of detail there, particularly perhaps the lack of confidence in the Petrograd Soviet that it doesn't actually move to try and take full control of Russia at this time and set itself up as the government, but instead allows the Duma, the provisional government, to do so. But they do pass in March 1917 this order number one. And it's very important and very powerful in terms of the constraints it then puts on the provisional government as a result. Order number one really means in practice that without approval of the Petrograd Soviet, it will be difficult or really impossible for the provisional government to pass military orders. So the Petrograd Soviet puts itself in a place where Without its approval, the provisional government, remember the war with Germany is still raging and Germany occupies parts of Western Russia at this time, um, it makes it impossible for the provisional government to exercise the war freely. So that's a huge issue for um, the provisional government and it certainly weakens them in terms of their management and control of their armed forces. So the, the dual power that we often talk about in 1917 in Russia is as a result of this order number one and it pushes the Petrograd Soviet into a position of authority although they don't assume the responsibility and the role of running the government. Um, Lenin now, obviously, of course, he's going crazy. He's in Switzerland. He wants to get to Russia and kind of be part of this kind of organic revolution, you know, what he's dreamed of and what he's written about for years and years. Um, one of the key things, again, Corin and Fine are very clear on this, and you can find this, the details of the legislation in plenty of places, is the provisional government takes some incredibly liberal steps. They end the death penalty. They take a break on censorship. And they also begin to liberalise um, many of Russia's um, kind of 
more austere authorities, including um, breaking up the secret police, which will cause them no end of problem, because really they take away all their, their, their mechanisms of repression. They also begin to um, move towards organising land reform in the countryside. And while that might seem like a good thing, one of the key challenges now for Russia would be keeping its frustrated soldiers on the front line. They're already been infiltrated by Bolshevik and other revolutionary agitators and now news from the spring of 1917 onwards is giving many of the soldiers of peasant background um, a reason to go home so they can be part of the land reform. Lenin manages to get back to Russia in April 1917 and kind of of course he's he gets the assistance of the germans all the way through the germans are keen for him to go back and start causing more mayhem in russia and you know help their war effort against the russians um i'm not quite sure if the return was triumphant as this but certainly lenin is welcomed back in petrograd in 1917 and he launches his april thesis and it's worth a look to familiarize yourself with a couple of things where they dive where the april thesis where lenin's ideas diverts from traditional orthodox marxist theory and his ideas for what to do in russia his key ideas of course peace bread and land the promise that he has to work to deliver upon coming to power all power to the Soviets, and that's very important. Lenin acknowledges, even at this early stage, that the Bolshevik party is still a small political party. Many Russians have heard of the Soviets and approve of them. So he doesn't say all power to the Bolsheviks, he says all power to the Soviets to get appeal. And that third big idea that he has, which will save the Bolsheviks in the end and increase their credibility, is no, no cooperation with the provisional government and no support at all for the war effort. And these last two ideas distinguish the Bolsheviks from most of the other Russian revolutionary parties at this time. The Mensheviks and the SRs, perhaps slaves to orthodox Marxist ideology, thinking of the stages of history, wanted to, you know, acknowledge and encourage the existence of the provisional government because it would enable Russia to enter that bourgeois phase, that capitalist phase in the stages of history. And many, many patriotic Russians, of course, were keen to continue the war against Germany and the provisional government had this bizarre policy of revolutionary defensism to fight to defend the revolution. So there's a number of things going on that traditional Bolsheviks and certainly many Mensheviks were quite anxious about. The divergence from Marxist theory and a commitment to end the war against Germany. And remember, like I said before, Germany is occupying huge swathes of Russian territory at this time. Um, Alexander Kerensky is our key politician from the provisional government and as I said his fortunes wax and wane and definitely have waned by the end of the period um, but you can see from this picture taken in the spring of 1917 he is a you know popular choice um, and he moves quickly up through the kind of um, regions of power again as I said before Fidge is really very good on Kerensky so do be sure to look it up and his job changes throughout this very brief and dramatic time period. In the meantime, though, the first All-Russian Congress of Soviets has been organised and is meeting in Petrograd. Um, the plans for this have gone on for quite a while. And um, in April 1917, they convene and some of the delegates simply don't go home. They hang around in Petrograd throughout the spring. And then there's another kind of big convention in June 1917. Um, remember the, the Soviets had been set up in Petrograd in 1905 and by 1914 had spread to about 45, 50 cities and towns all across Russia. The Bolsheviks are still not a large party within them. Remember, it's the SRs, the Mensheviks that dominate, but their support is growing at this time. And the resolution passed at the first All-Russian Congress of Soviets says this, that this conference will support the provisional government without assuming the responsibility of the work of the government. And this is a crucial, again, this perhaps this um, orthodox Marxist idea that the bourgeois revolution, the bourgeois provisional government should be supported. But it also means really that the revolutionary parties are quite content to kind of sit back and criticise the provisional government without actually sort of picking up the mantle and doing any of the work 
themselves. Um, Pipes writes this, um, says this actually in 1995, and really I think, you know, as I said earlier, this is it. They're quite happy to criticise the provisional government but not do anything about it. But at the same time, none of the political parties were willing to push themselves forward in order to um, take control of Russia, except, of course, for the Bolsheviks and Lenin. Um, there are a number of elements of kind of, I wouldn't say chance, but there are a number of elements of unplanned things that kind of sometimes aid the Bolsheviks and sometimes go against them. Under tremendous pressure from the British and the French, the provisional government had remained committed to the First World War. There's huge nationalism in Russia, of course, and Kerensky launches an offensive, his Minister of War at this time, which we sometimes call the Kerensky Offensive. I suggest call it the June Offensive, then it helps you kind of place it in your mental timeline of where it goes. Um, under tremendous pressure from the British and French then, um, Kerensky probably is hoping, I think, that a victory would kind of cement the government control. And remember, the provisional government itself, the name means temporary, but I think it would help the authority of the provisional government. And um, they go ahead. It's an absolute disaster. Um, there's high levels of desertion already in the Russian army. Um, and really, by this stage, there are officers in the Russian army being murdered. Everything about it is just a nightmare. And it's at this time, really, then, that Kerensky is forced to resign. Also under pressure from the cadets in particular, and Fajis points this out in his book, um, the operations of the provisional government are adjusted to try and increase um, their facilities for repression, in particular things to do with freedom of assembly and freedom of speech. But the June offensive is a disaster for the provisional government, it's a disaster for Russia, um, and it's a personal disaster for Kerensky. Um, as we said earlier, those land reform measures that the provisional government had introduced had created a problem for the Russian army. Soldiers were deserting the front line under the terrible conditions and heading back to their home villages to try and get you know, hold of the land that they believed was rightfully theirs. Um, there's tremendous violence and disorder across many parts of the Russian countryside and some tales of horrendous violence against um, landlords and um, in the countryside. Um, in this mix then, with the failure of the July, with the failure of the June offensive, with the land reform issue and the general chaos of the situation, particularly food problems um, as well, food shortages in the city, remember the transport infrastructure is being diverted for the war, all of the people, many of the young men that should be growing food are now fighting, so there's lots of different economic pressures in Russia at this time, including inflation. Um, with the arrival of the Kronstadt sailors, Red Kronstadt, remember, as that naval base was known outside of Petrograd. Petrograd. in Petrograd in the July of 1917 causes several days of riots. Um, the causes of the July days, again, it's not planned by the Bolsheviks, but they certainly try to maximise it. It ends in disarray and disaster. Troops loyal to the provisional government put down the riots after a couple of days, um, and various revolutionary leaders have to escape. Lenin goes into exile. Trotsky kind of has to rescue Viktor Chernov, the leader of the um, socialist revolutionaries. And in the end, it seems like bad news for the Bolsheviks and good news for... And have a good news for Kerensky, but certainly a survival for Kerensky and a survival for pro the provisional government. And the July days, it almost seems at this point that the Bolsheviks aren't ready. There's no, the turning point for them here hasn't come and this kind of spontaneous public uprising hasn't helped them get what they want. Um, the Kornilov revolt, I think, you know, is certainly one of the excite really exciting moments of this year. And again, Corin and Fine are very useful. Um, have a look on Orlando Feige's website as well. And do, f have the, do watch the silent movie October and have a look at the clip. It's just a beautiful Soviet portrayal of what happened. Um, it, the, the, co the causes of the, co the Kornilov revolt probably aren't as are probably more established now than they had been, you know, five or ten years ago. Um, I'm going to hurry because I'm running out of time on the screencast. Um, so do have a look there and see what you can find out. But it's really the disastrous, disastrous consequences for Kerensky. 
Um, as a result, um, Lenin and Trotsky completely inspired now, and Trotsky's kind of kind of restrained Lenin, you know, that kind of intense drive that he has. Um, they form the Military Revolutionary Committee, begin to organise for the revolution, and at the start of the month they're able to execute it. Um, key thing for us, particularly pop up later with the purges as well for higher level students, is note the kind of opposition to the revolution at the time from Zinoviev and Kamenev, because that will come to haunt them later on. Um, sorry it was a bit rushed at the end, but I hope it was useful, and thanks for listening.